So today, we're going to talk about the gifts of teaching. But before we get there, I want to kind of talk just real briefly about uh, something that, that Jeff covered last week. Um, not, not to sort of reiterate what he said, but to kind of uh, maybe add a little bit to what he said. In the book, um, they both combine and separate the gifts of pastor and teacher. They talk about them as two separate gifts, and they, and they teach them as one gift uh, that is a combined, or what they call a dual gift. Um, and in just a few minutes, we're going to read a couple of verses, and I want to uh, kind of help us to understand maybe where that sort of struggle between whether this is one gift or more than one gift, where that idea comes from. Uh, because it is in Scripture that they are uh, sort of not exactly the same thing, but they're tied together so closely uh, that they are spoken of as one gift. And the, the reason for that uh, we'll see in just a few minutes. But I just want to clarify that idea. These are two separate gifts, a pastor and a teacher. They're not one gift. They are, however, very closely tied together. And we'll read in just a few minutes about how that works. There are three separate passages in the, in, that list these uh, gifts among the spiritual gifts. The first one uh, being found in Romans chapter 12. Uh, it says, Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching. That's in verse 7 of Romans chapter 12. And then in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, it says, and God has appointed the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administering, and various kinds of tongues. That's the second place where it's listed. The third place where we find this gift listed separately is found in Ephesians 4 and verse 11. And uh, the ESV reads this way, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. Now I want you to pay careful attention to the way that uh, verse is structured in the, in the English language. You'll notice that it, there are commas between apostles, prophets, evangelists, and then it says the shepherds and teachers. Now, they did not forget a comma in that sentence. Here's the reason why. In the Greek, I'm going to read to you just real briefly, and I hate to go back to Greek to teach this concept, but I think it's important, and it does kind of clarify why they structured the sentence the way they did in the English language. Now, there are two words that we want to pay attention to in the original language. One of them is day. D-E is how it's spelled. Now, that word is a conjunction. A conjunction, if you remember from your days of uh, your youth, is a word that ties two things together in a sentence. Words like and. Uh, but, and those, those are conjunctions, those are things that tie two parts of us, two different things together. Well, day is a word that is called a conjunction, but it is a different type of conjunction. It is called an adversative conjunction. So what it does is it ties two things together, but says these are separate things. These are related in some way. We're tying them together, but they are not the same thing. We are separating them. So when you read that in the Greek, you would put a comma. So in a list, you would have this item, day, this item, day, this item. Make sense? Now, there's another word in the original Greek, kai is this pronouncing, K-A-I is, this, is it, uh, the spelling. Now, that word is also a conjunction. It, however, is a much more binding word. For example, you find this word when you see in the, in the English, Lord and Savior. Chi is the word that ties those two things together. They both describe exactly the same thing. Does that make sense? So when you read this verse, Ephesians 4.11, in the original language, what you read is this. And I'm going to read it in the order that it's given in the Greek. So you have to kind of make a little bit of change of the order of words. It says, and he gave some indeed to be apostles, day, and, uh, i got to find, my, pass my notes, and prophets, some, and, day, 
evangelists, and day, shepherds, and here the word is chi, and, and then teachers. So what he's done, what, what the Greek says is he gave some, there's four things that were given, apostles, prophets, evangelists, and the fourth thing is shepherds and teachers. Does that make sense? So because of this structure in this particular verse, there are some who would tie this thing together, pastor slash teacher, is the best way to understand that particular verse. Does that make sense? Now, having said that, they are separated gifts in the other verses that we find them in Scripture. And so it's important for us to understand that they are so closely related because what is the job, Jeff talked about this last week, one of the jobs of the pastor and the person who has this gift of pastor, what is, his, what is one of his jobs is to feed the sheep, right? And how does he do that? By teaching, by teaching God's word. So it is something that is necessary for a person with this pastoral gift to also be a teacher. It is not necessarily so that someone with the gift of teaching is a pastor. That's how they're different in that sense. Although you will often find that the person that has the gift of teaching also has some strong attributes that, re, re, that look an awful lot like pastoral gifts. Okay, so, but that's how they're separated. It's not so much... Uh, <clears throat> It's not so much that they're so completely different that they're foreign to one another, but they're the same. Now, Leanne asked a question a couple of weeks ago that I have not had a chance really to address this question, and I want to kind of talk about that now because as we're talking about these two gifts, really this one gift that is two separate things, or if you want to think about it, two separate things that can be talked about as though they're one because they, it'd be the way you look at it, it's all the same. Um, one of the things I want to mention here in answer the question that she asked is why is it that so many of these gifts look the same? We talk about wisdom and knowledge that are really very closely related. They're not exactly the same, but they, they sort of overlap dramatically. The gift of teaching and pastoring overlap an awful lot. The gifts of, some of the service gifts are kind of the same way. Um, and we think about, you know, when we define the gift of pastoring one of the ways that we define that is using some of the other gifts the gifts of leadership the gifts of uh, exhortation and so forth and prophecy and that sort of thing and and it's very difficult to sort of separate these things but as i was kind of praying through this and, and trying to find an answer because it's not really clear anywhere that i've been able to to see but i started to think about the reality that God gives these gifts for what purpose? All of them for the same purpose. What is that? Edify to edify the church, to build up the body of Christ. Ultimately, that's the purpose for all of the gifts. You and I may have a particular gift. You may have a different particular gift, and you may have a different one. But all together as the body of Christ, we bring them all into the church and bring them to bear in the church. And that is how the church, this local body of believers, is growing because of that uh, that truth. Now, one of the things that we also know is that most of us have, if you say, what is your gift? Most of us will think about, well, I have this gift. Well, I've come to think of it, I kind of have some of this other gift. And, and, well, maybe this other one too. And you think about two or three of them as you think through these gifts and you say, well, all of these kind of describe me a little bit. And one of, some of them more so than others. And so if you think about that reality, that not all of us have, you don't have just one gift. As you uh, grow in Christ, what sometimes will happen is some of these other attributes that we describe as spiritual gifts, some of these other things that are found perfected in Christ begin to show up more and more in our own lives. And we realize that the truth is that I may have just one primary gift, but I almost always in every Christian you're going to find some subordinate gifts that support that primary gift. The reason that this is important to understand, if you think about this, 
If you have a box of Legos, what can you build with a box of Legos? I mean, you build a whole lot of different stuff, right? You could take these little pieces and put them together. Now, what if all of the box of Legos were the four peg things? What could you build with that? Could you? You can build some different shapes, right? It wouldn't all have to be the same thing because you could put, sometimes you could put one Lego on top where you're only covering one of the posts and sometimes you could cover two or sometimes you could just make them a stack and, and so you build them in different ways. You can make some different shapes out of these even though there's only one particular shape Lego, right? You can make a whole bunch of different things. Well, this is the same way a lot of things in God's creation is built. If you think about your DNA, all of us look very different one from another. We have different thoughts. We have Some of us are allergic to things that others are not. Some of us like certain foods that others don't. All of these different realities in our bodies. But guess what? We're all made out of human DNA. But that human DNA is made out of about 16 or so different sets of chemicals arranged in different ways. When God built his church and gifted his people to build his church and to make his church grow and to help his church grow strong, he puts different gifts in varying degrees in his people so that this church can grow the way that it's supposed to grow. So why do some of them look an awful lot alike? Because a lot of the ministries that these things are meant to fulfill are being fulfilled in the lives of some of the same people with some of the same problems. If I ask you and you think about what kind of difficulties do we face as Christians today, some of the difficulties that we face are all, we all are going to have some things in common. We're going to have some things that are different, and so we need different gifts in the church, and we need different people who are gifted in different ways in order to serve this church in this place today. So why do they look the same? This is back to Leanne's question. I think part of the reason that some of them look very similar is because as God puts them together inside each of us, Jeff, I'll use Jeff as an example. Jeff says he does not a, have the gift of leadership. He, However, a pastor, if you look in the book here, says that one of the things that a pastor needs is the ability to lead. Well, Jeff doesn't have that strength, perhaps, as is one of his gifts, but there is somebody in this church who has that gift who can make this church operate the way that it needs to operate, probably on the deacon body, because that's the way our church is built and the way our church is structured. And so we have all of these different gifts to serve the church the way the church needs to be served. Make sense? So now let me get back into the actual subject that I wanted to talk about, the gifts of teaching. I just wanted to cover that mostly because it was a question that was kind of hanging out there and it really bothered me that I didn't have an answer for it right away, but I've been reading and praying and trying to figure out why exactly, what, because it didn't make much sense to me either. Um, so the gift of teaching, um, the word that is translated there is didaskalos or didaskalos, depending on how you want to say it. And really it means instructor, someone who teaches or shares information with others. Um, the gift of teaching uh, is talking about one who shares with others and teaches specifically from the Word of God. Now, if, uh, if you have, uh, if you do any kind of reading, uh, uh, perhaps you've heard the term didactic method of teaching. Some of you teachers may have heard that uh, in school. The didactic method talks about teaching by engagement. It's not just me or someone. Uh, throwing out a set of facts and facts and facts. Didactic teaching, this method, this word, really involves teaching specifically by engaging others. How do we do that with the Word of God? We talk about God's Word and the, the truths that we find in God's words as it applies to our lives. That's really specifically what teaching is about, is about Someone, in, in the case of a teacher that is gifted in this way, they're going to read God's word, they're going to share God's word with you, and they're going to help you to find how does this work in my life. Because if it doesn't apply to you, what good is it to you? None whatsoever, right? 
Um, so so that specific, keep in mind that as we talk about this, th this idea of a teacher is all about engaging us. If we're in that, that side listening to someone who's teaching, it's about being engaged with the scripture. From this side, it's about trying to find how this scripture uh, uh, involves you as the, the, the body. Now, one thing I want to care, uh, add to this is this idea about, you know, because we talk about, is there a difference between preaching and teaching? The Jews, <laughs> interestingly enough, uh, it, he talks about in here, the Jews, if you were preaching, you would stand up. If you're teaching, you sit down. Why that is, I don't know what symbolicness of what that really means, other than that's just sort of their traditional way. So if you're sitting, you're teaching. If you're standing, you're preaching. Yeah, maybe that's maybe there's some meaning to that, but that's what the Jews did. But as you read the New Testament, something that you find as you read the different things that Jesus did, you'll find that there are phrases like, and he got up to teach. In the Jewish world, that means something different than uh, he gathered everyone down and he sat down to teach. That means something different to them. So I don't really know exactly what it means that's different, but that's what the book says, and I just thought that was an interesting thing. So the goal of teaching really is about discipleship. In other words, how does this lesson, how does this material apply to your life specifically? That's the word didactic. That's what it means. It's about application. It's about engagement. Okay. Uh, so where preaching typically is designed in such a way that it leads you to make some choices, leads you to make some decisions. Brother Jeff, at the end of his sermon, always goes down front to allow for us to do what? to respond to his messages, right? And how we respond, it may be differently. Some, some may want to go up and say, I need to talk to God about this, and they go up to the front to pray. Others may uh, uh, pray in place. Sometimes you'll see people come and want to talk to Jeff and say, hey, look, I'm, you know, this, I've made this choice or I've made that choice and these decisions. All of these different things. That's the design, that's the goal of preaching is to help lead you to a decision, help lead you to this choice. Teaching, on the other hand, is about helping you to understand uh, more about uh, spiritual growth. It's a little bit about understanding some different things about biblical knowledge, not just about the Bible, but about God's word or about God himself and some different things about him. So teaching is more about helping you to grow closer to Christ. Preaching is more about helping you to find as you grow closer to Christ, helping you to reach different decision points in your life. That's sort of the goal, uh, the design of preaching. Now, in uh, John chapter 8, um, uh, there's an example in there that says, Early in the morning he came again to the temple. All the people came to him and he sat down and taught them. Again, that's just that he sat down to teach. But one of the reasons I wanted to print that verse, besides the fact that they had listed it here, which uh, includes this, but one of the reasons I bring that verse up is this idea of one of the things that we find in Christ is that everywhere he went, every time we see him in Scripture, he is, he is engaged in doing what? What does he do all the time we see him? Teaching. Teaching, preaching, right? He is all about sharing the word of God with the people that he encounters. Now, as Christians, it's our responsibility to be able to do the same thing. And we're going to talk in just a few minutes about, uh, about that calling on the life of Christians. But I think it's important for us to recognize that Jesus' entire purpose on this planet, as he lived his life, his entire being was surrounded by this idea that if you came into contact with him, his mission was very clear. His mission was to let you know and understand the kingdom of God is at hand. You are here in the presence of God. And he wanted you to understand that because ultimately your need as a teacher, his need was to engage those that he encountered with the word of God. Now, the reason I point that out is 
as I think about this, one of the things that, that I know of myself is this gift of teaching is something that is in my life. But I also know that I have a really... I have a really difficult time sometimes just meeting people and talking to people because everything about me makes me want to teach. I, I ran into this just early, I can't remember exactly what it was. Debbie said something and I had this, this, this I, just something I knew, it came out. It just, I don't mean for this to happen, but it's a part of my nature. This was Christ as well. Um, now what he did as he uh, encountered people, he was all about teaching. All of these gifts, as we look at the life of Jesus, one of the things that we, we refer to back in this book a lot is we find the perfect form of each of these gifts in the Messiah. And so um, that's why we look back at, at him as an example. Another, there's another example that they give in the book that I think is kind of interesting is that Barnabas is sent to Antioch because, and the Bible says, because he was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and faith. Barnabas was sent there because there was a new church forming and the church in Jerusalem uh, wanted to make sure that this church got off to a good start. So they sent Barnabas. Do anybody remember what Barnabas was? What was his gift? Encouragement. Encouragement. Exhortation, right? That was his gift. Now, I think it's important to realize that Barnabas, as uh, having this gift of exhortation or this gift of encouragement, is something that the people in the city of Antioch really needed at the time. However, it's not enough to feed the church, right? We need something beyond that. So what Barnabas recognized, and if you look in the Acts chapter 11, you'll find that what Barnabas did after he got there, he spent time encouraging and building up the church. But he realized this isn't enough. He needed somebody else. He sent for Paul. And he actually, the Bible, the way he said it, the, he scoured the area where he thought Paul was, looking intently for Paul because he knew that the, it was he was needed. Paul, as a teacher, was needed at Antioch. Because what the people needed was a little bit more than just encouragement. They needed to be fed. And being fed is what this gift of pastor or teacher is all about. It's about building discipleship. Okay, So um, this is a good example uh, to me of the reality that as important as one gift may be, it is never more important than another gift. All of these different gifts are important, and I've said it, and I've said it, and I've said it, and I'll say it again. Uh, if you're in this room, it is you are here in order to serve the others in this room. If you're a part of this church and you are not in this room, you are missing out on your calling in this church, not just tonight, but on a weekly, daily basis as we go through things. It's very important that we all be a part of this. And this story here is a good example. The Bible says that um, uh, at Antioch, they were first called what? Christians. And that, I think it's an interesting word. Um, that word, the I-A-N suffix, uh, really uh, means part of or party of. So what they were calling them was a part of Christ. They were calling him Christ people in essence. That's not a bad name, but they used it in a pretty mocking way at the beginning. But the reason they got that name, and I think this is, this is the part that I want to kind of get to, the reason they got that name was not because Barnabas was there encouraging them. They got that name because Paul got there and instilled in them this desire, this discipleship that was necessary for them to go out and share their faith with the rest of their community. That's how they got that name. They were mocked because they were out in their community sharing their faith. They were able to do that because Paul's teaching strengthened them and gave them the ability to do that. As you read through this story in Acts chapter 11, bear in mind that that name was not... It was not a warm fuzzy for them. It was, in fact, it was pretty, pretty demeaning, and it was intended to be pretty demeaning. Um, so they they put in the book some the person with the gifts of teaching serves a balanced diet of spiritual food from the Word of God, so the hearers grow and mature. One may be a gifted teacher without being a pastor, but one cannot be a gifted pastor without being a teacher. 
I think that's a really important statement. Jeff, as he clearly has this pastoral gift, um, a, talk, and when he talked about this last week, one of the things that I wanted to also do is to make sure that we separate in our minds the role of a pastor in the church and the gift of pastor as, spirit, as a spiritual gift. They are not the same thing. It is not necessarily true that a person with the pastoral gift is going to pastor a church. There are a lot of other ways that God can use these people uh, that have this gift. However, it is important that we understand that, that if you are pastoring a church, this gift, at least in some measure, is very likely to be found uh, as one of your primary gifts. It has to be because there are certain things that pastors do or will have to do <laughs> in order to serve the church that without this gift would be very difficult, if not just outright impossible. Okay, But to be a teacher uh, doesn't necessarily make you a pastor. I, I, uh, I, I'm going to stick to that belief because I don't believe I'm a pastor. <laughs> um, one requirement for being a pastor or bishop, by the way, these words, Jeff mentioned this last week, this idea, overseer, pastor, bishop, uh, there's some other words uh, that come from this. Episkopos is the, is the Greek word. Uh, but this idea is someone who, who manages the affairs of the church. Okay, This is the, the, the part of it. But one of the requirements for that found in 1 Timothy 3.2 is that he be able to teach. And so it's necessary for a pastor to be able to teach. It's not necessary uh, for a, a teacher to be a pastor necessarily it doesn't necessarily it, it usually does but it doesn't have to work both ways um, so <clears throat> one of the things that he that he makes a statement that I think is kind of interesting it says rather than being called the Sermon on the Mount this passage in and he's talking about in Matthew chapter 5 uh, it should be called lessons on the Mount because Jesus was teaching and not preaching in other words he wasn't standing and preaching to them he was interacting with them uh, as he went through these lessons. Now, one of the reasons that I point that out that I point that out is because I think it's important for us to understand too that when you are teaching, when you are sitting in a Sunday school class type situation, for example, or even in this type of situation in here, really the purpose um, of these sorts of things is to be. It's meant to be interactive. That means that. If as we, it's not just, it's not intended for me to sit up here and preach and and just never stop. It's intended for you guys to interact. Why? Because that's how you engage with Scripture, right? Um, so so let me ask this question as you're thinking about this, um, as you, how many of you, by the way, have have we covered the the, the your gifts? Have we already talked about your particular gifts? How many of you have we done that for? Some of you? Some? some? When you think about those, uh, that particular gifting in your life, this is the strong point. This is what I believe is, is, is my number one thing. One of the things that you will think about or maybe think about is the, the reality that um, if you are called... To do something in the church. I shouldn't say it that way. All of us are called to be active in the church. That means we have some activity that we're supposed to be doing in the church. Very often, that thing that we feel called to relates to our spiritual gift, right? I mean, this is kind of what the, the whole purpose for Christ gifting us in these, or for the Holy Spirit's gifts to do in our lives, is for us to be able to, to serve Him in some particular capacity uh, in the church. But here's the thing that I want to ask you. As you hear some of these other gifts that we've talked about, nearly everyone, and this one is not going to be an exception, nearly everyone that we've looked at, we have also talked about the reality that regardless of whether this is your gift or not, there is scripture that says you're supposed to do these things as well. Now, here's the question that I have for you. As you, as you think about your particular gift and some of maybe some of the, the other gifts, are there some things that you can, that not related to your gifts, are there some things that you can see the church has a need for uh, 
that you are not necessarily fulfilling that particular role. I'll give you an example. Let me, let me, let me give the example. That'll probably ask the question a little bit better. We in this church, we have a program that we're getting ready to start. The Awana program is getting ready to start back up. Um, we have... Uh, we, we have a certain, uh, you know, a number of different Sunday school classes. We have teachers for those. We have oftentimes a need in the nursery and some of these different things. So we see these different things that the church has a need for. Even though it is not your particular gifting, perhaps, to serve in one of those capacities to, to do one of those different things that we know the church has a need for, have you ever given thought to trying to do those things even though it's not your calling or your gift? And if you have not, why have you not? You don't have to answer out loud. But the interactive part of this is, is intended to get you thinking about what exactly this spiritual gifts thing is all about. Now, the reason that I ask that question in that way is because there's another question I'm going to ask you. What is our purpose as Christians? Or more specifically, what is the role of Holy Spirit in our lives as Christians? He is to do, what does he do for us and to us and through us and in us? To make us to look, look more like Christ, right? Now, we've talked about a number of different times in Christ... What is true about these spiritual gifts? They are all perfect, right? They are all complete in Him. And if we are to look more like Him, then we ought to be growing in these other areas as well, right? We have some areas. Uh, when I went through high school, for example, there were some people who I knew who absolutely dreaded every math class they walked into. Anybody ever, does that fit a lot of other people? To me, that was the most safe place for me to be was in a math class. I loved it. But when I went into the English class, I had a little more difficulty. Mostly because I couldn't keep my mouth closed. But <laughs> there are certain areas where I learned better than others. And one of the things that I recognize about myself years later after I am out of high school and I can look back on it with glee, I guess. Um, and I can look back on my career in high school and I think about, you know, I spent an awful lot of time working and learning and studying all of these different principles in math and physics, which those are my two favorite things. But I really didn't spend a whole lot of time learning English or learning about these different principles in these different languages and, and perhaps these other areas. Mostly I didn't do them because that wasn't very easy for me. But now I read God's Word and I read where we're supposed to look more like Christ. It's very easy for me to learn and spend time looking at the different things where it says Jesus sat down and taught this thing. And I think, oh, well, I can do that. That's easy. But when Jesus says, bring the little children unto me, I go, he's crazy. <laughs> I mean, I, I always thought that the little children that I bring to church, I'm sending them to somebody else. That's the way it's supposed to be going, right? But the reason I wanted to ask this question and kind of start this discussion and this thought process in your mind is as you think about these other gifts, some of you would absolutely hate the idea of trying to teach a lesson in church. That's where God, though, when he calls us to do that, sometimes he's stretching us. He wants to see if we have the faith to step out there and he'll equip us yep. if we're willing to do what he wants. Yes, sir. I agree. I agree. And that's, that's kind of the, the reason I, this is, I just want you to think about, we don't necessarily have any uh, place necessarily where any, any teaching roles where we're missing people. We do have certain other areas, and the children's department is one that is 
very difficult to find people to fulfill these things. And it's difficult because that, for some of us, is one of the most difficult. I cannot even imagine. I will look for other things to do in the church so I don't have to go in the children's department. Amen. <laughs> so, and, and, and I'm just, I, I'm, I'm not lying. I will. I mean, I, I'm up there on Sunday mornings in the video booth. I'll stay up there. Okay, but the, the, the point that I'm making is this. As we think about these different things, you need to be in a position to where you recognize that even though this is not perhaps my calling, this isn't my gifting. We need to be willing to step outside of that and understand that Christ looking like Jesus, looking more like him, involves some of these different things, some of these different gifts that he has perfected in himself. He intends on us exhibiting these same qualities. And I'll give you an example uh, for as far as teachers uh, are concerned. Mark chapter 4. Again, he began to teach beside the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. The whole crowd was beside the sea and the land, and he was teaching them many things in parables, and his, his teaching, he said, and it goes on. Uh, Matthew chapter 5. Seeing the crowds, he went up in the mountain, and when he sat down to teach... Uh, when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them. Uh, James chapter 2 says, says this, Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Now, the reason that that verse is in here is because they make a statement in here that something that is often true of teachers, um, and it's not always true but it's often true there are teachers that may not have the gift of wisdom and you remember what the gift of wisdom was about anybody about application of god's word in our lives right the wisdom is the ability to understand what god's word says and then be able to find how that applies specifically to our lives that's the gift of wisdom now um if you happen to be um a teacher that doesn't have this gift of wisdom also, here's what it says about you in the book. It says, some teachers make great Bible college or seminary professors because they can explain the meaning of biblical languages, give impressive lessons on technicalities, opinions, uh, and so forth. However, they often look at the application of something elementary and therefore try to avoid it. <laughs> That's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's the, the reality is that for some people that, that are teachers, they tend to just share God's word with you, and they can share their, but that's as far as it goes. This is what the Bible has to say about this thing, and that's it. Some have the gift of wisdom as well and are able to, to try to apply it uh, to our lives. Me, I find both gifts about equal knowledge or wisdom and, and teaching uh, in terms of how I respond to these tests. That's what I see in myself. Um, uh, and so I, I, that is something that is dangerous for them. But the problem with that is that the Bible says that we're supposed to be doers of God's word, not just hearers. And if we don't, if we don't know how it applies, how can we do it, right? So, so there you go. People with this gift can often be menaces to the church. Say it isn't so. Uh, they can be overly critical of others. Um, especially of evangelists who always preach the simple fundamentals of faith and seldom get deep into biblical truth. I can tell you from personal experience, it is sometimes hard for me to listen to a children's sermon and, and not be critical of hearing it. I don't, mean that in a, I don't mean that in a bad way, but it's something that's true of me. It's very difficult for me to listen to those not because I don't think it applies to me, and not because I think it's not important for children to be able to understand the gospel, but sometimes it's so simplistic, it's so hard for me to think, man, if only he told that kid that Kai means that it's together and, and Dave means it's separated. It, that, that, those sorts of thoughts really do go through my head as a teacher. It's very difficult for me to not be critical of other teachers and other people in the church uh, because their understanding perhaps is not the same as mine. Um, it, maybe it's not, that, it's not that I'm better or smarter. I don't even think of it in those terms. But as I hear people talk and they misunderstand scripture or they don't, 
apply it in the right way to their lives or they're they're hearing it and then it just goes over their head and, and passes them by and they're not trying to apply all of these different things this can make sometimes this this role or this gift of teaching it can be a very difficult burden to bear um, the other part of this is is this very difficult for me to not take an opportunity to teach uh, Paul said uh, in Ephesians I, that woe is me if what if I do not preach the gospel, woe is me if I do not teach. Why? Because this is what God called me to do, and I have to do this. And so what I tend to do is I take opportunities like just says, well, why don't you teach Wednesday night? That's great. Why don't you teach Sunday school? That's an awesome thing. And when I go somewhere else, and, I t and why don't you give take it? It can be very difficult to prepare all of these lessons, and as I do, get so many of them and so many opportunities to teach maybe uh, one of the things that I run into is I run out of time to do them effectively this I think is a problem that a lot of us have with our particular gifts we have a difficult time anybody say no that's that's hard it's hard it's not easy to do but I think God has called us to be um, to be effective at whatever it is he called us to do. And so I think sometimes, um, for me at least, that's, that's one of the difficulties that I have. All of us have this responsibility to teach others. And I want to read this last verse. Colossians 3, verse 16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. By the way, what does that phrase mean? Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. What, would that, what does that phrase mean to you? Okay. 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 Richly, and then what's the next word, or the next phrase? Teaching and what? Admonishing one another in all wisdom. So, now this is not just to teachers. This is a command given to who? Christians, right? So. Your responsibility, my responsibility as a Christian, is to allow God's word to live in me in such a way that it could be called richly, basically means it should be visible. How many of you have money that, to be able to do certain things that never shows up on the outside? All of you are wearing clothes tonight, I see. Thank you, by the way. Um, so... We, so these things, this this richness that we have is shown on the outside. Let God's word dwell richly in us. It should show on the outside. God's word lives on the inside. And it should be used in order to teach and admonish. And every Christian is responsible for this. Um, one another with all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. This is another thing that's important that we all do. Um, and uh, with thankfulness in your hearts to God. In other words, we are called all to teach others about our Christ. And if you're going to teach about him, the first thing that's necessary is that you know about him. And the way you do that is by doing what? Studying, Studying his word. Reading is a, good, is a good thing. Reading God's word is important. But we have to take it one step beyond just reading and actually study. That's what brings it inside, right? All right, comments or questions? All right, well, I'm going to take us off of Facebook. And hopefully the Facebook thing worked pretty well. It was 